Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast daily. I'm Bill Landis. That's Jeremy Birmingham. We're Berm, we haven't done this in like three weeks. We're back for the Monday rewatch. It feels weird a little bit, especially doing it after this Michigan State game where it really feels like more of a first half rewatch uh, yeah. than a full game rewatch because the second half, while valuable for Ohio State in the big picture, uh, doesn't really teach us much about this year's team. And um, I think that that's exactly what Ohio State needed out of this weekend. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more. So we'll we'll focus mostly on on the first half here. Um, I'm happy to be back doing the rewatch pod. It, it felt weird not doing a, you know, a traditional Monday rewatch the last few weeks with you and Austin on the road. So we're able to do it here with the home game. Uh, we usually go position by position, but I I don't know that we need to do that with with this particular game. It was a 38 to three win that was like analytically over in the middle of the second quarter so um i think rather rather than do that berm just kind of talk about some stuff that we liked or, or just really like anything that kind of jumped out to us as we were re-watching the game so uh, i'll give the floor to you uh what is top of mind for you after re-watching that the first thing that really and i said this uh, immediately on snap judgments on saturday which is good it means the snap judgment like was sound i think this is a game where ohio state could have named their score uh mm-hmm. and if they wanted to score 66 points on Saturday night, they would have. Um, and it, it's a situation where Ryan Day, and, and it's, this is something I posited preseason, Bill, and I don't know that it's always the best way for a college coach to handle things because college football is not the NFL. But I have felt like Ryan Day was managing this season like an NFL season from the very start, and I've said it over and over. And Saturday just reminded me of that again. Like, this game is over. Let's move on. Let's not worry about anything else, um, and, and that's okay. I mean, I think it's it's important for Ohio State to get. Th- they're, they're already dealing with a number of nagging injuries, um, potentially season-ending injuries like Lathan Ransom. Like, don't even put yourself in a position to risk it. Um, and so, I think there was actually a moment in that second half where the Buckeyes sent out the first team with the with the first drive. Ameka Buka gets up a little gimpy again. And then I think that was the moment for Ryan Day, like, okay, we are not even doing this. Yeah. Which was confusing that he still continued to put Kyle McCord in the first team offensive line out there for another uh, 10 minutes. But uh, I guess that was because he didn't think he had another option. And if he's going to keep McCord out there, he has to keep the first team offensive line out there. And so it, it is what it is. But um, big picture of this game. The special teams, which, again, everyone talked about on Saturday, is the only thing, I think, where you can look at it even with a critical eye. Uh, I I believe that people will have their questions about that again. I'm sure that, you know, I know you and Doug did listening to the pregame or postgame show on my drive home on Saturday, uh, late Saturday, early Sunday morning, late Saturday night. I could see it on Ryan Day's face on the field how just exasperated he was at the mistakes that were happening. Uh, and I don't know if that's because he was like, ah, oh, damn it, I'm going to get more questions about this. Or <laughs> if he was like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening again. So yeah. uh, it, it, it's it's certainly one thing to watch. But other than that, and unless you're trying to be extremely hypercritical slash nitpicky, then I don't know what you can look at this first half of the game and even have a potential complaint about. No, I, I agree with you. I like they scored on six of their first seven possessions. The one they didn't score on that kind of had the field flipped on them and were basically in their own end zone and just had to punt the ball after after a three and out. And I mean, I guess if we want to be critical about that, that third down and three play was a weird play call from your own nine yard line. And yeah. Matt Jones got absolutely blown up on that play that that ruined it. But um, if you want to be critical of that, I, I don't know if your if your offense is moving the way it was, do you not take a shot there? They hadn't covered anybody all game. Yeah, I guess uh, I think you're right. I, I don't know. I guess you just don't want to mess around and like, I don't know, get a ball tipped or have them walk in on, on a pick six when you're that close to your own end zone. I think I understand that. Um, what it you did, to- is it what it did is it gave Michigan State the field position to get their only field goal today. Michigan State did it not did. get inside of the Ohio State 34 yard line the entire game uh, they didn't yeah. which yeah which was like because they were watching the game live on saturday night like maybe the first couple of drives i felt like is michigan state moving the ball on them like in a way that's problematic and then re-watching it I, I don't know that i felt that way there was like one 27 yard run that ohio state allowed where they kind of lost the edge but but aside from that i don't i don't know that i felt felt and i think there was like a slant for like a 15 yard game maybe yeah but that was kind of it drives. the first two drives in both times 
I think it was because, and this is going to be a recurring theme, and it has been the last two weeks already, and I think it will be for the next couple. No lace and ransom in that bandit role changes things considerably. Uh, if yeah. uh, I think on that first slant that you're talking about, it's against Denzel Burke. Uh, Sonny Styles playing the the uh, the bandit is like falling backwards and sort of getting into coverage there, where lace and ransom, I believe, probably blows that up for an eight yard gain instead of a fifteen yard gain. Um, and then the twenty seven yard run that uh, Nick Nick Brooks had. It's just like Malik Hartford just took a bad angle. And I don't think, mm -hmm. again, if, if it's Lathan Ransom out there and his experience, that probably doesn't happen. That edge got set and, and Steel Chambers couldn't get get clear of it. But I think Lathan Ransom cleans that up for a nine-yard play instead of a 27-yard play. Yeah, I, could, I kind of felt the same way. But I also felt, um, and I know we're like, kind of like jumping around here, but I kind of That's all right. think it makes sense. Yeah. Aside from that play, I thought Malik Hartford played pretty well. He had a, he had a couple of play. He had a one where he kind of like ran up into the flat on a pass play and like kept a, a play that probably could have been a first down to three yards. Had another one where he he tracked down a run uh, in the backfield or near the line of scrimmage. Like I, I thought the first time he got the opportunity to start this year and they pulled him out early, I thought he was just like way too over aggressive and taking himself out of plays. And in this game. Maybe there was a play or two where that happened, but they kind of let him play through it. And then I thought he settled in and and kind of looked like the guy we, we heard so much about during during the offseason. Yeah, I mean, th that's what the reason you recruited Malik Hartford is because he's a super aggressive kid who wants to lay the wood. Uh, and, and that is the issue you're going to run into. We're in year six of Josh Proctor's experiment, and he still mm -hmm. does the same thing. So um, Josh has just learned a little bit through playing time where exactly he can take those risks and where he can't. I don't think Malik is in that spot yet, but uh, it it's unfortunate that you're almost certainly going to be without Lathan Ransom for the rest of the regular season. And probably if the big 10 championship exists for Ohio state, probably that as well. But like the last night, obviously we're recording this on Sunday folks um, last night and this coming weekend against Minnesota, especially the way the Minnesota offense is, the way that they're going to run and try to get downhill, like is, is vital for Malik Hartford to understand this heading into Ann Arbor. Yeah, he's going to get put in, in big spots, I think, the next couple of weeks, which is why it was encouraging to see him uh, play the run, I thought, I thought pretty well uh, in, in this game. And he's going to have to do it for sure I mean, the next two weeks. He played the pass fairly well, too. I don't The pass yeah. interference they called on him was garbage. That's a terrible mm -hmm, call. I agree, yeah. Is, is there not – does college football, did it eliminate the non-catchable ball rule? Like – I don't. I don't think so. It, it feels like it at times, but I don't. I don't think that's that, the case. That ball was ten yards out of bounds. I don't. I don't yeah. know how the official thought that he was going to catch it. Number one, but number two, it wasn't pass interference. Yeah. Um. What else? What else is on your mind? I mean, I, I don't want to bury the lead, but I think if, if, and I also don't want to get too excited about it based on what we saw against Michigan State's defense. But if you don't watch Kyle McCord on Saturday night and see a gigantic leap forward, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, that was by far his best game, and it was not just a matter of, um, you know, making the throws that were easy. The the second touchdown pass to Marvin Harrison, for example, the first play of the second quarter, like Marv absolutely puts his guy on skates, and Kyle puts it right where he needs to be. That's a throw every quarterback needs to make, and and he has struggled with those at times this year, either throwing those a little high or uh, putting him, you know, not in the right spot. But I asked Kyle after the game, I'm like, do you feel this before the game starts, or is it like you come out and you make that first throw and you're like, okay, I'm in it? And he said it's a little bit of both. I felt really good coming into the day. I think that's a byproduct of Ryan Day acknowledging in in his post game speech that maybe or they needed to get a little bit of uh, rest this week, and so the team didn't go as hard in practice. And, and I think it's smart because last year we talked all the time about how he kept saying they were going as hard as they've ever gone in practice. And yeah. like, okay, all your guys are hurt. So let's not do that. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was a number of plays that really stood out to me. There was the, the, the play action that gets blown up and then the little shovel pass to Cade Stover, which that's the sort of like playmaking play extending stuff we have not seen out of Kyle McCord. That sep that will take him to the next level. Um, you know, it's the type of play where when things break down, we haven't seen Kyle McCord show the ability to to still make a play for Ohio State, and he did on that play. But then there's you know the, the second I think it was what I think it was still the first quarter. Um, 
there was this little Ohio State's third drive of the game. Marv ran this little uh, flag route to the end of the the hole of the cover two that Michigan State yep. was playing on and, third down. Yeah, yeah, it's the it's the exact same play that they ran a week ago that was intercepted. Yep, and put the same thing. I, Kyle put it exactly where it needs to be. He hits Xavier Johnson on that wheel route later in the perfect spot. Um, he just made every single throw you have to see. And and I even think like the incompletions, uh, uh, Marvin drops one in, on a swing pass. Um, the first one is an incompletion that he throws because the bad snap by Carson Hinsman, he has to get rid of it. I think that was going to be a huge play for Emeka Buka, by the way, if you saw what I saw in the little end around. Um, but the the throws that he made, the, the the ball that Omeka took off of his helmet, like the on the holding call or DPI on the first drive of the game, like that ball was a laser beam. Like he yep. he, he just looked much better. And some of that's a, a, a reflection of the offensive line giving him a clean pocket all night. Some of it's probably a, a reflection of his ankle feeling a lot better and him being able to actually set and throw. Um, whatever it was, mechanically. Um, uh, efficiency, everything was just a a step above for what where Kyle's been, and I think that has to be pretty darn encouraging for people. He was only pressured four times on thirty one dropbacks, according to Pro Football Focus, which um, is important to keep in mind because we when Doug and I did the really long podcast about Kyle a couple weeks ago. The thing we we said and tried to make the point of is like when Kyle has time and when his feet are set, he's really good, and. Um, that was in the midst of a couple of games where the pressure rate had gone up a little bit. And this was a game where he really wasn't pressured at all. So he was able to operate comfortably. And I think you saw, you know, you saw what you get when, when Kyle can keep his feet under him. And I thought the touchdown throw to Marvin on the first one was maybe his best throw of the year, just like perfect over the outside shoulder away from the defender. Didn't invite the defender back into the play. Just a great throw there. The touchdown throw to Cade on the back shoulder um, was good. And I, I think a sign of like a, a growing connection between those two clearly, like Kate, Kate had a great game. Um, and I thought um, he got to his like second and third progression a couple of times too, which I don't know that we've seen a lot from Kyle McCord. And that's also like clearly a byproduct of, of some of the protection, but I thought yeah, it was, yeah. 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 And uh, like, I, I agree with you. Like, I think like I have been, I don't think that Kyle has regressed. Like, as we've had this conversation about like what's up with Kyle, never, never have I thought like, oh, he's he's worse now than he was yeah. three weeks ago. I just thought he had kind of plateaued a little bit and was still making some mistakes and missing some throws. You would you would hope that he wouldn't miss, but this was the opposite of that. This was this was the step forward that I know I was waiting for, and I think a lot of Ohio State fans were waiting for. And even if the opponent is not particularly good, like I, I, I don't know, I still think there's something to be said for standing in there and making some really high level throws. And I thought he made probably five or six of them in in this game. Um, so that was encouraging. Like I, I don't like that was the the crux of our conversation on the post game show is did did Ohio, did Kyle McCord show you enough to to make you think that Ohio State's ceiling might be a little higher than you thought maybe a week or two ago? My answer to that question was yes. Like what was your what was your answer to that question be? Absolutely. I mean, did, did I understand Georgia won fifty-two to seventeen or whatever? Did Carson Beck look like a better quarterback than Kyle McCord on Saturday? I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, did JJ McCarthy look like a better quarterback than Kyle McCord on Saturday? Michigan not throwing, not throwing eight passes. No. You know they. You know, uh, did Michael Penix? Uh, uh, did Bo Nix? I mean, you're playing against USC's defense. That's certainly worse than Michigan State's. Um, I, I think that if, if your question mark all year about Ohio State has been this team can make the playoff. This team can win a championship if Kyle McCord does this. Like that's what he has to do. That's the mm -hmm. performance you have to see out of Kyle McCord. Um, it, it, to me, this is the first step forward since the Notre Dame game. But I agree, it's been a plateau from that point to now. So it, it's it's like you're going up, you get there, and then you wait, and now you're up here. Once. One thing that I think is like a concern for me, if I'm going to still try to be somewhat analytical here, uh, is that there has to be another wide receiver that emerges for Ohio State as an actual passing threat for the Buckeyes. Uh, because Michigan, with Will Johnson and the way that they will probably mirror a little bit of what Rutgers did with the two deep shell to try to to keep Marv um, uh, as as a less of a threat. Someone else has to step up. The timing between Emeka Buka and Kamakor is still off. You can tell that. 
Some of that maybe because Emeka is not 100%. Some of that's maybe just because they haven't had a chance to really do a lot together. I don't know. Um, Julian Fleming, whether it's Carnell Tate, someone else has to emerge and be a viable second option on the outside. Yeah, I agree. And I I, I was hoping we would see Emeka kind of get back to his normal form in this game. And he did. He only had one catch. He blocked well, um, but he only had one catch and wasn't targeted a whole lot either. But they well, I mean, in the first half, Kyle had four incompletions. And he threw the ball to Emeka four times, and three of the incompletions were to Emeka. So, like, they're yeah. trying, but it's just it's just not there. Yeah, and then, like, I think next week could be an opportunity to work on that, too. Like, they're playing Minnesota. Minnesota, the last two weeks, has given up, I think, like, almost 600 passing yards and seven touchdowns to um, Illinois and Purdue. So, like, there should be opportunities there for, for them to kind of rekindle what looked like a really strong connection, right, in the Notre Dame game between Kyle McCord and Emeka Ibuka. I think it's got to be Emeka. Like, you're right. It could be Carnell Tate. It could be Julian Fleming. It could be whoever. I think it has to be Emeka. Um, he's too good to, to go through games where he's only getting one catch. Um, and in a world where, like, Marvin has so much gravity to him and Kate Stover's doing what he's doing, there should be opportunities to get Emeka the ball. So I don't know. I think they were talking about it during the broadcast. Like, Emeka, I think, is still trying to knock off that rust, and he's not quite 100%. He's just trying to play through it and get back to that level. And he's not there yet, but he, he needs to be for, for them, I think, to, to put their best foot forward uh, against Michigan. So that remains like a, a major key emphasis for me as we go into the Minnesota game. Like, can you get those two back on the same page? Yeah. And, and I mean, because if you can find someone to provide that boost uh, opposite Marvin and to complement what Cade does in the middle, it continues to open up things for Travion Henderson, who, you know, he had 13 carries in this game. Uh, five yards a carry or something like that. It, it's a nice, easy first half. He was this close to busting one all night, and I, I am convinced if he played in the second half, he probably would have ended up with 21 carries for 180 yards and hit like a long run or something. He, he's so much different than he has been. And the, the one play that really epitomizes that for me on Saturday uh, was in the second quarter. Uh, he gets the first quarter, towards the end of the first quarter, gets the ball, should have been a two yard gain. He does a little spin move at the line of scrimmage and picks up almost six yards. And that quickness that he has, that that little twitch that he has right now that he's not had since the first half of his freshman year is an absolute game changer for Ohio State. And if people uh, had any doubts about his like big picture potential or his his high level talent, like I hope that's put to bed because he is absolutely shot out of a cannon right now when he touches the football he really is um and i've noticed it on tv the last couple of weeks but it's different seeing a person on saturday night. like I've, i haven't been at all the games this is only the second game that i've been to but it looks different in person and, and I, on his first carry i thought i noticed that i think the first carry might have only been for like five yards but i thought yeah. like oh that looks and the next one was for 15 and it's yeah just a burst Right. Um, I'm glad he only got 13 carries in this game, that they were clearly trying to split it up more. They played chip train on more in this game and earlier than they did the last few weeks. I know that Travion's had a good run here of having over 200 yards of, of total offense and have been incredibly impactful, but they, they so desperately need him for the Michigan game that I'm I'm fine with him getting a little bit less of a, of a workload um, in this one. And I guess like, I don't, I don't think he stalled any momentum. He just ended up not being as productive, but that that's a reflection of workload, not, not play. I thought he played fine, uh, but he still got his touches in, in the uh, passing game as well. Um, I like this. They did a few things with split backs in this game uh, with yeah, Chip Trainum and then Xavier Johnson. A uh, couple runs and then use those runs to set up the wheel route that you talked about earlier to Xavier Johnson. And again, like I love Xavier. He does. He does a lot of really good things for this offense. Um, I'd like to see them put Trey in those spots too and see what might happen on, on a couple of those plays. And if you don't want to expose them in a game like this, I get that. But I hope we see some split back stuff like that against Michigan with Travion Henderson playing the Xavier Johnson role. Uh, uh, maybe, I mean, it, maybe it's because of the the ankle, but like I would put him back at Buka in that spot. You're trying to mm -hmm. get him back into the rhythm of the offense and into the flow of the offense. I love Xavier Johnson. I love what he does for the team. But like if you are running this stuff and everything that you've sort of created for Xavier Johnson was done with Jackson Smith and Jigba and Emeka Abuka in mind. Like why not use Emeka Abuka in that spot and give him a chance to, to get the ball. I mean, we've talked about it before. Like it's, it's like making a free throw for a, a guy who's in a slump as, as a shooter, like see the ball go through the basket, pick up 10 yards, get yourself in a spot where you're actually 
feeling like you're a piece of of what the offense is doing, and then everything else sort of un- unlocks. Um, but the, that formation uh, was awesome. Um, the the way that they've sort of expanded the playbook over these last couple of weeks has been really good. I mean, you talked about it um, post game. The the end around reverse to Marvin is is a type of play that I have been begging for Ohio State to run in <laughs> for a while. Where you send G in, in motion one way, and like it, it looked like something the Kansas City Chiefs are doing, or or like something that Washington State is doing. Just something where you're like, oh, like, look at that, a, a wrinkle that we have not ever seen. Uh, and now that opens up things because the way that the Buckeyes have been running the ball with Travion Henderson on the little counters and all that stuff, it it it, it changes the entire game. And uh, I think that Justin Fry and Ryan Day deserve a lot of credit over the last four weeks for being able to adjust the run game philosophy yeah. on the fly uh, because they are completely different right now running the ball than they were in that uh, four-game stretch between Notre Dame and and Purdue, and I, I think that they deserve a lot of credit for that. I was skeptical of of their ability to kind of like abandon what had been the bread and butter run play under Ryan Day, which is that stretch stretch wide zone play that I don't think suited the offensive line or the backs that they have. And like you're right, to give them credit, they did they did scrap it basically. They run it occasionally, they ran it a few times in this game, but I don't think it's their base run play anymore. It feels like that counter play is is a thing they're building a lot of things off of, and they and they have some some runs that I think like naturally pair with with that counter play as, as yeah. change ups. But they are they found things that work better for this line, and it's more downhill. It, I think it works better for Travion Henderson. So, like we we have we've had this like season long conversation about Jim Knowles and the uh, adjustments that he has made to to put Ohio State's defense in a better place. We've not had that discussion, I think, about Ryan Day and Justin Fry, and as it pertains to the run game. But I, I kind of feel like that's happening too, and it, it's made the the offense or it's put the offense in a better spot. Yeah, I also thought. I mean, if we're just going through random thoughts that mm-hmm. pop up about this game, I thought this was Cade Stover's best game as a blocker in a while. Yeah, it was uh, good. I, yeah. I thought that you, you saw him be more physical. Maybe that's because he he had the wrist injury that was hampering him that he got you know, fixed last week. And uh, the second play of the game, they ran that little counter tray uh, and uh, counter two tray, and it was Cade on on a pulling block that just wiped someone out that led him to fifteen yards and. I just think in general, the offense seems to have a much better sense of who they are right now than they did. Um, some of that's the offensive line. I think that they're still, I mean, if I, you've kind of brought it to my attention recently in some listening to you talk, but I think you have to circle the center position right now as a, I like, talk about uh, that. Yeah. I'm a little concerned about how this looks moving forward. Um, obviously, you're not going to change it right now. Center is a little bit different than tackle because you can't, just give the guy some extra help by keeping a tight end home or, or a chip blocker, or, you know, but uh, Carson Hinsman, I, I don't know if it's just because he's too tall, if he's not getting enough, you know, lower center of gravity in the, in the, just seems to be getting pushed back a lot. And I, I don't know why that is. I don't think his play strength is where it needs to be. I don't think he anchors well. I don't think he sustains blocks in the run game. He's had some nice running plays where he's gotten up to the second level and gotten on linebackers been pretty good, but he worries me against good defensive tackles, and they're going to face three really good ones when they when they play Michigan. Um, he has get, allowed the most pressures of anyone on the offensive line. He's allowed the most hurries of anyone on the offensive line. If you look at interior offensive linemen across the Big Ten, his numbers are high compared to most of them. I think he's like third in pressures and hurries allowed among interior offensive linemen in the Big Ten. We've talked so much about the tackles, and they've gotten so much attention from us and like everyone else that we've just not discussed the center position, which I actually think has been the weak link of the offensive line this year. Um, and I'm worried. I am worried about it. Uh, and I'm not like trying to put a, a spotlight on one guy, but I, that is the position to me that I think might be most concerning as we go to the Michigan game, only because of how good the defensive tackles at, at Michigan are. And I don't know that I've seen a lot of progress from that center position, which is why like it was it was noteworthy to me that Matthew Jones played center against Michigan State. Um, they kept four of the five offensive line starters out there, put Enoch Vamahi at right guard, and then let Matt Jones play center, what I believe for the first time in his career. Um so I don't know what the I, I I'm not saying like they're working some stuff out to see if they can make a change there. 
I guess it's at least good to know that they feel like they can go to that option if they feel like they need to play a backup center and it can be Matthew Jones because I I find that position a little problematic at the moment. And I think it's fair to be critical of it. Uh, It certainly has not gotten better throughout the year. I think it's also fair to say Carson Hinsman's only been playing center for one year. And so you're learning how to play this young. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't want to, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater here, but I think you, it's not a position you can hide on the field. That's the, that's the problem. Uh, and however you figure it out, and it, whether it is Matthew Jones, whether it's um, something else, I don't, again, I don't know how you hide center. So uh, yeah. Michigan's defensive tackles and between Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant and um, Christian, the other guy. Chris Jenkins, it, it, that's a really good group. And what you know about the run game is that the way you slow down the run game is by getting pressure up the middle. If you can do that, things are significantly harder uh, running the ball. Um, it, Ohio State will need to figure something out there. It, it, it's, I think what you worry about is that the blocking challenges bleed into other things like snapping the ball off of your butt, for example. Um, and, and, the, uh, and then it ends up being a bigger problem. So... Uh, that game in Ann Arbor is going to be absolute pandemonium. It is going to be incredibly loud. It is going to be incredibly violent. And I, I think that there is a moment coming for Carson Hinsman where he's going to have to bow his back a little bit and and get to, you know, he's a great kid, super nice kid from southern Wisconsin, right? Time mm-hmm. to be a badass. It's, it's yeah. coming. That game, like, we're going to, I mean, we're going to have plenty of time to talk about Ohio State, Michigan. That is going to be the biggest powder keg of a football game I think that maybe has ever existed. I, I told Matt Andrews from the Ohio State Radio Network on Saturday night that I was thinking about bringing a helmet up there. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. you guys on the field are, are, are in for one, I think. There is a, a very real likelihood of being struck by some sort of projectile. Um, yeah. You and Austin... I don't know if you knew what you were hinting at or if JT2 Malowau knew what he was hinting at on Wednesday night when he talked about he liked lining up next to Jack Sawyer, but correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first game all year we've seen those two on the same side of the defensive line, correct? I don't recall seeing it. Yeah, I think I think you're right. So, uh, it didn't hit home. It didn't get there. But interesting, nonetheless, because I think that they've realized that Jack Sawyer is playing really, really well, and he can help them at at, uh, at nose tackle and and be the guy op, you know inside of JT and allow you to still use Caden Curry or Kenyatta Jackson on the other side. It's really the first time all year we've seen Ohio State use that Rushman package, and so they're just adding and, and getting new things into the mix. Hero Canoe, again, played well when he got into the mm-hmm. game. I think that the step that he's taken for Ohio State has been vital. Uh, we didn't see a lot of Michael Hall. I didn't see snap counts, but I, I just don't so think he he, played a lot. he left the game um, in the first quarter. Austin and I, well, Austin noticed it first, and we were watching him. Like he he walked up the sideline and like he actually walked through the the camera area underneath the south stands, and I'm assuming went to the locker room. I don't think he played after that. And that was during I think Ohio State's third drive of the game. Um, so I want to look here and see how many snaps he ended up playing, but it, it could could not have been more. Uh, than a handful, he played 10 snaps. Um, he got like kind of folded over, like, like double teamed and like knocked down and kind of awkwardly on an early run play. And I'm wondering maybe if something might have happened there because, yeah, he didn't, he basically didn't play in this game after the first two series. Um, which maybe is why you saw Jack Sawyer play a little bit inside, but uh, that's a big loss, obviously. I don't, I don't know, if Brian Day wasn't asked about it. I don't think many people noticed that. Mike Hall wasn't playing a lot or that he had left the sideline. And I don't I don't believe he returned. Um yeah, I don't remember seeing so that's, him. That's I, something to monitor for sure. It's also I mean JT2 Maloa got bent in half uh and hurt a little bit. His back also in the second quarter. That was a play that they actually called a hold on Michigan State on, oh, the, yeah. defensive, on the offensive lineman uh, blocking JT. He was it, it was really it reminded me of the way that Matthew Jones crumpled Chop Robinson a few weeks ago. It was the same sort of block. Like he was basically just like compacting him into a tiny little ball of a person. Uh, it did not look comfortable, uh, but JT's athleticism allows him to be a little bit more flexy gumby than most people. I think. Um, yeah. What did you uh, think of, of Cody Simon in the middle? Uh, because I think this is, uh, I, I wrote about it on, on for the helmet stickers on Ohio state rivals.com, but 
and I talked about it on the keys before. It was sort of an audition for next year. Uh, it, like, mm-hmm. is this the guy that can be your next quarterback of the defense? And I, I thought Cody acquitted himself pretty well. I actually think he looked a lot more comfortable in pass protection or in pass coverage, uh, and, and you know, being comfortable in the middle of the defense than uh, I was expecting. I that was the first thing I thought about how he played was that he didn't. I, there have been a handful of times this year where I've thought he's looked uncomfortable, out of position. Not really sure what he was supposed to be doing in pass coverage, and I don't know that I noticed that in this game, which was good to see. It's a, it's a nice step, um, and maybe that's a byproduct of just playing more snaps and getting a little bit better feel for the game rather than kind of going in and out all the time. Um, but yeah, I thought he was good. Like he didn't. It wasn't like an awesome game, but it certainly wasn't a bad game. And I thought he looked like he belonged out there. So yeah. he'll be in an interesting spot next year, right? Because I he's he's an older guy. It'll be his fifth year um he's kind of a throwback mike linebacker which is like what is really your kind of value as you look toward toward the next level might it be more beneficial to you to come back for a fifth year start play a lot make some nil money i don't know that's an interesting conversation i i I wouldn't be surprised either way i guess but he does look like someone who could be this team starting mike linebacker next year yeah i mean he had five tackles he had a pass breakup multiple times he was in the backfield forcing pressure He's going to have to get home on one of those every once in a while and stop getting yeah. juke out of his socks. But uh, I thought that it was a a really just encouraging thing for Jim Knowles and, and James Laurinaitis to know that if Tommy can't go, you can put a guy out there that can lead the defense. Uh, and he did that. Now, I still want to see more of C.J. Hicks and Gabe Powers. Uh, both of those guys played the entire fourth quarter, positive direction. Um, but generally speaking, we... I think Ohio State will have a decision to make about the Minnesota game and how much you want to put Tommy out there. Even if he's 90%, I don't think you want to really run the risk of taking a step backward uh, heading into Ann Arbor. So uh, I think we'll see a lot more of Cody Simon there. And I, I hope, my hope is that CJ Hicks flashed enough for the staff on Saturday to give them the confidence to put him in earlier in the game uh, to maybe spell Steel Chambers, who has not played. I mean, I'd imagine he played more snaps on Saturday than he has in a month. So um, you're going to find some way to keep building CJ Hicks up here and, and let him try to develop. Yeah, yeah. Minnesota is going to run the ball probably 40 times next week. So I, I don't know if you want to expose Tommy to all that. Maybe you want to play him a little bit and just so he's not going into the Michigan game totally cold. But I still think I think you're right. I think it's a lot of Cody Simon next week. Hopefully more CJ Hicks and, and Gabe Powers, assuming that game can also um, get out of hand. I, like CJ Hicks had a really nice tackle for loss in the second half. They're like kind of shot in the backfield like a like out of a cannon. Um, that was the type of play they've been waiting to see from him. He rode the line of scrimmage down, mm-hmm. shot the gap, and made the tackle. Like he didn't allow himself to get blocked out. He didn't he'd get lost in the wash. Like he he was able to stay clean and then he attacked and that's what they've been waiting to see like that's what his athleticism should allow him to do as long as he's reading the play correctly and being where he needs to be like but you can't it's that old adage like oh well experience necessary well how do you get experience like you you get experience by playing and you so sometimes you're going to be out there and maybe not look like you know what you're doing but that's because you don't you can't know (laughs) until you know yeah no i agree uh I'm I don't have anything else. Anything else on your mind before we wrap up? I just really think that uh the play of Jordan Hancock has been an absolute rev- revelation for Ohio State this season and I I mean he's one of the guys preseason we talked about like okay, well if he does this, he's a guy who could go to the NFL. Like I think you now have to be worried about how do you replace Jordan Hancock next year and I can't believe we're having that conversation on November the 13th. But I think you have to be worried about how you replace Jordan Hancock next year. Um, and I don't know if that's a conversation that we're ready to have yet. But uh, yeah. Jordan, his versatility, the, the the third, Michigan State's first drive of the game, it's third and two. They're going to go for it on fourth down if as long as they don't lose four yards. And here comes Jordan Hancock just destroying a tight end. Forcing the quarterback to be to to bounce out and, and let Senzel Burke clean up the play. And you're like, that is a nickel cornerback destroying a tight end. It should not happen, but yet he seems to just be doing that every single week. It might have been that play, or perhaps there was a play later in the game where I turned to Austin and I said, I think Jordan Hancock might be too good. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's become too good too fast. Yeah. Uh, so like he's 
like I thought like my maybe my favorite defender in all of college football to watch last year was Brian Branch at Alabama. Jordan Hancock has some similar stuff to him, I think. And well, Brian, Branch, Brian Branch out of high school. I mean, there yeah. was an Ohio State Alabama battle, so uh, you can get it. And, and then you see, like, down the interception return against Rutgers, he was like 22 miles an hour on his 93. Like, uh oh, that's that's unfortunate because you know you 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 hope for a kid like that who is the top of your board as a defensive back in the class of 2021 can't play for two years because of injury. Now all of a sudden he plays so well that he has to leave, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, the Mark the Marshawn Lattimore path. Um, I don't know. I, I, I th the thing with Jordan Hancock is I think he has first round upside because that position is so important in the NFL. And it's like, are they going to draft him in the first round after playing only one year at Ohio State? Maybe not. So I think that that might be Ohio State's saving grace here. But yeah, Jordan Hancock looks like a guy that um, is not long for college football <laughs> with the way he's been playing lately. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty unfortunate. I mean, yeah. not for. Not for him, uh, it's but great for, for him. Yeah, yeah. who has been looking for that guy for the last four years, and all of a sudden he's there, and poof. <laughs> That's what happens when you recruit good players, I guess. Uh, yeah, other than that, I don't have anything. I, I just think Ohio State, this is exactly the type of game Ohio State needed, like I said at the mm -hmm. start. I mean, you you had to have a game where you came out fast, showed your dominance, and let your young guys play. It's invaluable for Lincoln Keenholz to get into that game and play 10 minutes of football. Like, it's invaluable. Uh, I wish they would have let him like the third down play, uh, the 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 throw to the end zone with Carnell Tate. Like, I I was I was talking to Kyle McCord post game, and I said, "Hey Kyle, you know, it's a shame Lincoln couldn't hit that pass." And he's like, "Yeah, but he had he had a uh, he had someone else open on the other side. He should have just thrown it to him." I'm like, "Oh, okay, so I'm like <laughs> tough, tough crowd." But I wanted to I want to see Lincoln pull the ball and run. I wanted to see yeah. him like go out there and. and Couple times, you know, I loved the little rollout pass that he had to to Jelani Thurman. Jelani I think Thurman. you see why people are excited about Jelani's potential. And those are things you we haven't seen all year because the games have been so wonky for Ohio State. Uh, I hope that next weekend is the same way. Senior day, it's it should be an opportunity for the Buckeyes to let some of these guys play again. Um, and, but you also can't go into that weekend looking past the game. The week the week before Michigan, the last couple of years has been bizarre no, multiple times so uh, I, I think you just need to get in there take care of business and let the same type of game happen it should happen uh minnesota <clears throat> excuse me minnesota got his doors blown off by purdue uh this past weekend so uh it it should look like more or less what this game against michigan state looked like which again uh you know it's just fun to beat up a bad team sometimes and ohio state i think needed that and it was it was uh entertaining to watch that but I, I don't know uh how much of it you take moving forward other than you know feeling good about yourself which is which is not the worst thing in the world so uh i, I also think harlan barnett and michigan state deserving credit they did not quit like mm. I, I thought they came out and, and threw punches like that there, that is a bad team that does that plays with pride at least it was yeah. not like a group that uh didn't seem like they you know they didn't want to be there they weren't sloppy they weren't making a bunch of mistakes they just they're just not they just don't have the players uh, but especially I, on I offense, think, yeah, yeah. I think Harlan Barnett and, and that staff deserve some credit because, like, that is going to sound disrespectful. It's the perfect sparring partner for Ohio State. Like, yeah, it, it was that's what that game felt like to me. It was a spar, it was not a, a real match. But Ohio State can learn some important things about themselves. Harlan Barnett and Michigan State can say, Hey, we went, to, we went in the ring and we, we fought them, and now we can see where we need to improve. Like, it, it that's the type of fight that was and i think um it, they deserve credit for getting in the ring and, and and throwing punches and so um yeah they're bad especially on offense but not everyone has players like marvin harrison and Travion henderson they sure don't um not even the uh the other two good teams in the big tennis they don't have players like that which was noticeable uh early on saturday so uh yeah i think it's a uh, it's good for ohio state to feel good about itself and build some momentum build some good habits uh figure out some things that work for them as they uh keep ramping up toward the game at the end of the month against Michigan. But there's one before that. It's Saturday against Minnesota. We'll have coverage all week here uh, on the podcast leading up to that game, all the stuff you've become accustomed to. Later on Monday, Doug and I will have uh, Kings of the North. We'll have a uh, rooster show. What time is Roosters on Monday, Burn? 11.45 a.m. We will be in the Horseshoe Lounge at Roosters on Old Tangy River Road. Yep. So if uh, you're able, want to stop by, watch the show, hang out, talk to us, we'll be there. We always like when people do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can find that show here on the podcast feed along with everything else we're going to be doing this week. But that will wrap up uh, today's episode of the Podcast Daily. 
for Berm. I'm Bill. We'll talk to you guys later.